You have been in the music industry for a long time around Australia. Uh, I like to point out that I've been into music for a long time. Music industry, I'm in and out of. <laughs> All right. I don't really like the music industry, so. Oh, yeah. Well, can I ask how you actually got started in the music industry? Did you have a family that was into music or? No, not at all. Oh, they were a little bit, but I actually started out wanting to be uh, an artist, like a painter. Right. And then I, I kind of pursued that for a while and then I fell into studying electronic music at, uh, under this guy called Felix Verda. Mm-hmm. That was about 1975, and I got hooked. And from then on, that was my obsession. And then it was around about the same time that the sort of very, very early beginnings of punk rock and stuff started happening. And uh, I'd already been kind of doing that kind of thing uh, with friends. We'd been jamming and doing... We'd been listening to Velvet Underground records and that kind of thing, and we're jamming along those lines. So, you know, we were sort of punk before punk, really. And... Then I joined an actual punk band, which was the first punk band in Melbourne that was called The Reels, which is R-E-A-L-S, not The Reels, but became famous, mm-hmm. and uh, played with them for a little while. And then after that, I met Roland Howard, and we formed The Young Charlton. So that was my early beginnings. And uh, Young Charlton's really frustrated me because I just wanted to get back to doing electronic music. So then I started my band Whirly World, which was more electronic orientated. And, so you uh, were like into yeah. electronic music before electronic music was actually really popular? Yeah. Mm. And from what I've read that you your music, your electronic music and that sort of paints a picture. It's a, Yeah, very much so. Yeah. 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 It's all about the art, really. Yeah. And as you mentioned, Roland S. Howard, and you, of course, worked with Michael Hutchins on the Max Q project. Yeah. So you've had a lot of your good friends that you've actually lost in this industry as well, haven't you? Oh, yeah. And there are plenty more as well who aren't famous. Mm. So that, that were close friends of mine that were also making music and I made music with that died as well. So... But they weren't famous, so they didn't get the press. No. But, yeah, it's unfortunate. It's just a part of the lifestyle and stuff, I guess, especially in those days. I mean, people lived pretty rough back then. Well, the movie Dogs in Space, which you were a big part of the music for that yeah. movie, was that yeah. how realistic was that of the time? Look, I think it was a kind of a, a fantastical version of the time. I mean, I certainly didn't live in a house like that. I lived in a house that was probably wilder than that house, but mm. it didn't have the kind of junkyard aspect to it, but it certainly had crazy things going on all the time. I think, uh, I mean, the, the thing is, I wasn't involved with the actual people it was based on, mm-hmm. that film, like I didn't meet them until a lot later, so I never went to that house, you know, never went to those parties, and but I'd been to similar parties, and, you know, look, it was... As accurate as a film can be, um, it's still a, a film, you know? Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, a lot of the fashions in the film are, I think, a little bit too modern. Yeah, people were dressed a lot more plainly back in that time. Like in, in the movie, there's a lot of like, gothy-looking people, and there weren't back then, mm-hmm. particularly in that time period of 79, 8, 1980, you know, 81. That didn't come till a bit later, so, yeah. And you did have some role in the movie, didn't you? Yeah, well, I played myself in the film. <laughs> so you were in, in the band? Yeah, in, in numerous bands. I was in some of the little bands as well. Oh, right. Is that how you met Michael or did you already know him? No, that's how I met him was on Dogs in Space. And, of course, he did my song rooms for the memory at the end of the film. All right, yep. Well, how did your musical relationship develop with him? Well, after Rooms for the Memory, which went top five, I think, he, some time later, I think it was quite a long time later, he got in contact with me and asked me if I had any other songs because he was looking to do something outside of In Excess, like a solo album or something like that. And I said, yeah, sure, I've got some other songs and played him some demos and he loved them and flew me and my friends up to Sydney to record them. And we did two songs, I think it was Way of the World and Buckethead. And then he scrapped the idea of doing a solo album and doing a, a band album instead mm-hmm. and just just doing it all with me and my friends. So that's really how it happened. Well, Way of the World is a song that I think is quite timeless. I think 
it would you know do just as well today as it did back then. It's just as relevant today. No, you mean lyrically? Yeah, even musically, it does. It's not a song that sounds like it's from an era. It's a really good song. I mean, you could release that tomorrow, and young kids would think it was a new song, and they'd love it. Yeah, probably need a bit of a tweak, but. <laughs> 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 bit of a dance beat, but then that's what you're the master of nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> well, you always have been. Mm. Actually, I've noticed you've got your own SoundCloud and you do have new music that you've put up there. Oh, yeah, I do new music. Well, I've been just getting back into writing again. I've had a pretty bad period of ill health, but I'm just getting back into writing again. And, and I do have a SoundCloud page, but I'm going to, this, this year I intend to actually hopefully make some vinyl and put out a proper release. Mm. And not just give away stuff for nothing. Like, you know, I just want to do something really, you know, impressive this year. That's my plan. How do you feel about everyone talking these days about vinyl making a comeback? Has it ever gone away for you? Well, no, it went away. Definitely went away for me because I think CDs are fine. But I think that the thing is that people want an artifact. And that's why, I mean, the, since the digital domains happened and, you know, streaming music and iTunes and all that kind of stuff, People still want something that they can hold in their hands and look at and look at the artwork and read the lyrics if there are lyrics on it and you know, read all that information. You could never do that on a CD anyway. It's too small. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know a lot of kids who buy vinyl but don't even have a turntable. They just want the actual artwork and most vinyl is limited to you know 100 copies or 500 copies or something like that. And that's also, you know, so you're buying a piece of art and you know, you're buying something that might be worth something one day, you know. Mm. I mean, you can stream music for free on Spotify. Why, why would you bother buying it, you know? Yeah. So do you do your own artwork for your releases? Well, I'm, I usually have the plans for it and I get other people to do it. This next one, I'm not sure because I haven't made the album yet, so <sighs> I'm not too sure what the artwork will be, but I've got, got ideas about it. But it depends how the album turns out, really. One of the questions I was going to ask you, you've already kind of answered, because I was going to ask if you didn't end up doing music, what you might have done, but was there anything else outside of the artistic realms that you had an interest in? Outside of artistic stuff? No, yeah. not really. No, just live and breathe creativity. Yeah, yeah. Business isn't one of my strong suits. <laughs> <laughs> and... You know, I mean, look, I guess helping other people would be something I'd be happy to do, like if I was up up for it, you know, helping homeless people or whatever, you know. I mean, that sort of thing interests me. But realistically, I mean, I'm here as an artist. I mean, that, that's my role in life. And if I go deaf, which is hard, you know, as it's, I've already already deaf in one ear. So if I lose the hearing in the other ear, I'll just go back to painting, you know. Yeah. You did actually go and live over in England for a couple of years too, back in the day. Yeah, and Norway. All right, and Norway. Well, my family are from Norway. All right. Like, I grew up in Norway as well as here. Oh, did you? Yeah. Were you born in Norway or here? No, I was born here. So what was it, I mean, were you dying to come back to Australia or were you just... I was kind of forced to come back to Australia, really, because uh, England held no... Uh, I just couldn't get anything happening over there. Right. Like I cut a record there, I couldn't get anyone interested in it. And I'm just tired of living in squats and really struggling and doing terrible work for menial, you know, menial work for n- no pay. And I just got to the point where I couldn't stand it anymore and I thought I've got to go home and at least there I've got a little bit of respect and I might be able to get this record out and get back into the Melbourne music scene so that's what really what brought me back here. Well that was a band called Hugo Clang that you had going then what type of that's music right. were they were they punk or were they more electronic? Uh, Hugo Clang in England was very Captain Beefheart kind of style right I guess you could explain it as it had electronics involved but it also had a brass section and guitars and drums and bass it was really crazy music, but then there was a new version of Hugo Crane when I came back to Australia that was purely electronic. So yeah, there's a couple of different versions of that band. Yeah, so you, I guess you going into the punk and things like that and the, the other types of music, was that was probably more influenced by your friends and that rather than the industry itself, wasn't it? Well, 
well, they were just influenced by the times. I mean, uh, the thing about it is, is that, you know, punk happened, it was just part of the zeitgeist, you know, it, just, it happened simultaneously all over the world at the same time. I mean, I was making punk rock music when Patti Smith was, but I just didn't have a name for it, you know? No. And so were other people in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane. I mean, the Saints and Radio Birdman were doing it before there was a word for it. It wasn't until the Sex Pistols and fashion and stuff came along that it you know, got this name about it and direction, you know, of, of sorts. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, as I said, you know, the zeitgeist was from in the spirit of the times. It was just like that. And, I mean, the same thing happened with when the rave scene happened, you know, the early techno scene. I mean, that just kind of happened everywhere at once. Mm. It wasn't invented by the English, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happened everywhere, you know? Yeah. I mean, the roots of it are probably from Detroit and Chicago and stuff, but there are already clubs that were playing like hard electronic dance music long before the rave scene happened. You seem to have had a career where you were right up there with the biggest people in Australia in the music industry and you've lived a life working alongside those people, but you still managed not to be the human headline. No, I'm not really a human headline type. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel fortunate that you've been able to do that? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I, I don't like, I, I don't have the comforts of the human headlines. I mean, I live a pretty frugal life, which is a good thing. Pretty happy with my lifestyle at the moment, even though I'm not well. But I've got a pretty good situation where I'm living now, so it's good. But I, I don't never wanted to be famous. I think fame is just bullshit. And uh, I'm only interested in making interesting music. Mm. And fame and all those kinds of things force you into repeating yourself. And I'm not into repeating myself. I'm into always exploring and finding new, new ways of doing things. If I can take you back then to Michael Hutchins, I don't know, with the telly movie that just came out, like I know full well that Michael himself had no involvement in any part of that movie and what was said and done, but there was one part where they showed Michael was fighting to do more recording with you on the Max Q project, but they insisted that he stick with In Excess. Do you think that his fame stifled his creative outlets oh absolutely yeah yeah i do think so yeah i think his attachments to the band and to the management were too strong and i mean michael was a very you know lovely guy and he felt obligated to the band and to the management and i think they they had a lot of power over him in that respect i mean that's why you know, max q was under publicized overseas I mean, it got publicity here, it did quite well here, but overseas it did nothing because it got no publicity, no, nothing at all. So had it done well overseas, it would have been a very different story for me, that's for sure. Yeah, but that yeah. part of the movie was true. Yeah, it was, yeah. Hmm. I mean, it's good in a way that he was loyal, but then it's bad that he couldn't explore himself properly and maybe, you know, he would have been a happier person. Well, I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you watch the telly movie? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. God knows why, but I did. <laughs> well, because you needed to see what they said, what, yeah. how they presented it. What did you think of it? Can I ask you that? Uh, look, I just thought, look, all of those rock biopics are trashy. Uh, I remember seeing one on the Beach Boys years ago, and it was hilarious. It was so bad. I mean, the excess one wasn't that bad, but it was pretty bad very poorly made, badly directed, badly scripted. You know, just as a film, I th thought it was really pretty unentertaining and, you know, not, not very good. And I thought also I didn't like the way they handled Michael in it a lot of the time. That, that was kind of difficult to watch. It wasn't the Michael you knew? No. No. Do you know Michael's family? Do you still have any contact with any of the people? Uh, with that... his sister Tina, I do, yeah. Right, because they had nothing to do with the telly movie either, did they? No, of course not. No, no way. They hate it. <laughs> I'm a bit confused. Was was it the band behind that movie? or? Yeah, the band and the management, yeah. Right. People, when they're retelling their stories, they're always going to be protecting themselves from a lot of the stuff that happened too, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. It's human nature. Yeah, but anyway, we'll move on from that. With everything that you've done and everyone that you've worked with, I mean, there must be hundreds and hundreds of special memories you have, but is there something that you hold fondest to you? Probably 
Look, I mean, there's been special moments when, like, you play with, um, I've forgotten the name of them now, but uh, Paul Grabowski's orchestra. I right. played, uh, played as a guest soloist with them once. That was fantastic because it was a really different experience. Uh, I also worked on a guy called Richard Mills, who's a very famous conductor and composer here. I uh, did all the electronic stuff for this big opera he did called Batavia, and that was great because, again, it was working outside of my normal sphere and also the films I've worked on. Like I did, besides Dogs in Space, I also did a film called Head On, which won a lot of awards. Mm. And uh, more recently, I did a horror film called The Loved Ones, which was great fun because I always wanted to do a horror movie because you can really go for it with the music. Yeah. And that turned out great. And another film called Birthday that won quite a few awards as well, just a small independent film. I really like doing film soundtracks a lot so it's great when they turn up because they don't turn up very often because there's not a lot of films that get made in this country so but that's because you do have that whole visual aspect as yeah part well of it. i really respond to film i mean when uh, i find it quite easy to write for film yeah usually you know because they just give you the the edited film and you just start writing i mean that's the way it usually works and i usually think the fir- very first thing i think of is what ends up being in the movie is there any chance that you'll ever write an autobiography no your secrets no. are going to the grave with you yeah well, i don't have any secrets <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think I worked at a bookshop for about 10 years and to me there's a very thin line between fiction and biography. So I often think that there is more truth in the fiction section yeah. and I'm just not interested in doing an autobiography. I don't have the ego for it. You know? I mean, people keep telling me I should write one, but I just want to write more music actually. So that takes up enough time, you know. Yeah, that's great. What instruments do you play? I mainly synthesizers. Right, so you don't play guitar or trumpet? Or... I, play, I can play guitar and you know, other things as well, but not ter- I'm not a brilliant musician, more of an ideas person more than anything else. I'm a composer. I'm not an instrumentalist at all. But you were a singer for a while in some of your bands too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I sang for ages, yeah. Were you not comfortable being a singer, or did you enjoy that no, at the time? No, I loved it. I loved it for years, but then I, I lost I lost confidence in singing and kind of gave it away. Right. Going back to instrumental music now, so... It, I just, it's hard to know what to ask you about, because I can just imagine you've done so much, and you would have so many stories to tell. I just feel like sitting there saying, tell me stories, but then they all involve other people, and you don't want to tell stories about other people, do you? I don't mind. Tell me a story about Roland S. Howard, what he was like and some special well, memory you have with him. He's a wonderful person. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's who I learned how to write songs off because before I worked with Roland, I wasn't writing songs. I was just making noise, really. And he'd already been writing songs for a couple of years. So I started writing songs with him. And in that way, I actually you know, learnt song craft was through Roland and we were very close for a while there and yeah, I loved him dearly, yeah. I do remember actually seeing an interview with you and Roland on YouTube. Oh, when we were young kids, yeah. Yeah. You sounded like you were both very intelligent and maybe both private schoolboys. <laughs> well, we kind of were, so... <laughs> Well, what about Michael Hutchins? Have you got a story like, you know, time that you spent with him that you look back on and glad you had that moment? Uh, Look, I mean, I had lots of good moments with Michael. I mean, I think my favourite moment was that we went on a holiday together in Tahiti and that was just amazing. We just had a really fantastic time. Yeah. And I've got very fond memories of that because it's probably the best holiday I ever went on. You know, it was really lovely and yeah, but just I've got lots of good memories of Michael. Just his sense of humour and uh, his intelligence, and you know, just 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 a wonderful person. Yeah. And we used to laugh a lot and take the piss out of each other a lot and all that kind of thing. Did you know the rest of the band very well at all? What, in excess? Yeah. Not really. I mean, I get on all right with Kirk. The other members of the band, I didn't know that well, so yeah, it had nothing to do with them. I mean, I've met I've met them, but I don't really know them. So yeah, they've come under a lot of judgment lately, and I think that they lost a lot when they lost Michael, and I don't think it's fair for any of us to really judge where they're coming from. Mm, well, 
I think that whole rock star and excess thing was the biggest pile of poo I've ever seen in my life. I can agree with that. <laughs> that was that was I a mean, desperate really, time. When died, they should have quit. That they should have finished doing the band. Yeah. And you know, them just trying to hang on to past glories, but mm. they could never really admit that Michael was such an important. He was more than a member of the band. I mean, he was the band in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, it's like the Doors without Jim Morrison. You know. But what did surprise me in that telly movie actually I'd always heard that like in excess that the Farris brothers took the credit for all the writing I thought that Michael hadn't been really involved in the writing but in that telly movie I was corrected on that that he was the lyricist yeah you know, he, he I think early in the early days they all contributed but then uh, later on it was just him and Andrew that did, did all the writing like all the big albums all the hit albums it's those mm. two that wrote the stuff. And, well, you did work with him on a couple of songs. Did he write the lyrics for those? I wrote most of the lyrics on, well, on all the singles. I wrote about 90% of the lyrics on the Max Q album. Right. So that um, just was something he enjoyed the music and that, not that he was involved in the actual creation of the songs. Well, no, he was involved in the creation of the songs in, in that he had ideas and put them forward and... They were really good, but we act, we actually wrote lyrics together, and uh, that was interesting. And he came up with some lyrics of his own that we use on, on a track. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't a lot of the Max Q album is, is basically mine in terms of the writing, but uh, as I said, probably about ninety percent. Do you still have a copy of that album? Of course I do. Yeah, <laughs> of course you do. Somewhere <laughs> <laughs> it's been put away for a little while. Well, I've I, I just moved into a new place, so I don't have all my CDs are elsewhere at the moment, still right. in storage. Was Max Q released on CD, was it? Yeah, it was, yeah. Oh, right. Oh, cool. I'll have to get a copy of that off you one day. <laughs> well, hopefully it's going to get re- reissued this year, so... That would be brilliant. Who would that be through? Don't know yet. It's all, I'm just talking to the Trust about it at the moment, so... I don't know much about it at all, so I can't really speak about it because I don't really know which way it's going to go. So it's the early days yet, but it's the 25th anniversary, so uh, we're really going to try and hopefully get it released this year. You've seen the industry go through so many cycles and so many changes. What advice would you give to young people starting out in the music industry? I Just be persistent, really, uh, and follow your own path. Like, don't just try and copy other people. It's a waste of time. Try and do your own thing. That's the best thing you can do is be original. Uh, try and find your own sound, which is a hugely hard thing, hard task anyway, but it can be done. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what people need to do. Yeah. And, well, you're still doing that. Yeah. Hopefully we're going to get to hear a lot more of your music because you are still making music and you're still collaborating with people and I guess you're still looking for people who inspire you to collaborate with. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about or wanted to say? Uh, (laughs) Put me in a a place there. (laughs) Mm, Let me think about that. Look, I mean, I think one of the things I do like to say is that people seem to think that everything's been done before, Mm -hmm. and it hasn't. I mean, music, we've just barely scratched the surface. Music is uh, an infinite thing that goes on forever, and it's just popular music is the thing that people tend to hang on to because it's easily accessible and all that kind of thing, but there's all other kinds of music that are going on that don't fall into that category. And I think that it's, there's endless room for innovation. Even in pop music, there is. But it's just a matter of people having the courage to do it. And that's said from a man who's always looked for a new sound, isn't it? Yeah. And still is. Yeah. And we are very lucky that you still are. Thank you. <laughs> and I do. I look forward to hearing the new material that you come out with and... I really hope you get that Max Q album re-released. That'll be cool. Thanks so much, Kate. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. It has been fantastic talking to you. Thank you very much for giving me your time. That's a total pleasure. I feel a bit overwhelmed that you agreed to speak to me. Thank you. That's okay, Chad. Don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> and I would definitely, whenever you're releasing something new, I'm here if you want to have another chat and help promote it. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, and hopefully I will get to meet you one day. Yeah, you will. Okay, thank you, and have a good night. 
Yeah, have a good show tonight. Thank you. Bye. Okay. See ya.